Today, I will be exploring building jets capable of flying higher, further, and faster in order to satisfy the contract High Altitude Observational Surveys of Kerbin. In this episode, I will be showing you how to build not just one, not two, but three very different jets, each taking advantage of three very different engines. The J-33 Weasley, the J-404 Panther, and the J-X4 Whiplash. I will explore how these engines differ from each other in their uses and capabilities as well I will take a detailed look at the various air intakes the game provides to ensure you pick the right intake for the job. Let's get started. So let's start off by taking a look at our contracts and we're going to be concentrating on these observational surveys. One, I got two of them, the Conduct and Atmospheric Survey of Kerbin and Conduct Observational Surveys of Kerbin. Let's take a look at the Observational Survey one first. This requires us to do crew reports and you can see this is over a variety of waypoints, five of them, and they're all clustered fairly close together. So once you're there, you can bang them off pretty quickly but they are a mix of belows and above certain altitudes. You can see here below 17,000 meters, but right above it, it says above 18,000 meters. Now we've only looked at one jet thus far in this series that featured the low tier Juno engines. And that jet doesn't have any hope of getting above 18,000 meters or anywhere close to that. However, I did talk about some low tier ways of getting above those altitudes anyway and if you want to you can check that video out there's particularly good if you have only a single of these above ones to do however what we're going to be concentrating on in this video is building some jets that are capable of just routinely flying above these particular altitudes and we're going to look at three different jets so i got this one with a mix of belows and above and if i go up here i have conduct atmospheric surveys of kerbin and here we have to do pressure scans that's using the barometer and all three of these are above these altitudes uh, where you need to have a high altitude jet and as mentioned in the intro i'm going to be building three jets in this video but the first one will not be able to achieve these altitudes. I'm showing it to you anyway because it is an important step in the evolution of the jet engines that are in the game, connecting the Juno from the earlier tutorial to the high performance engines I'll be exploring later in this video. As well, despite using parts lower on the tech tree, you will see that it is still a very useful plane for exploring the various biomes of Kerbin should you wish to do so. And speaking of tech, let's look at the tech that is required for this build. And because I'm pretty late in this career at this point, I've unlocked a lot of different nodes, but what you need for this particular jet is not particularly high. You need to have this tier unlock so that is the fourth tier of the tech tree you would also need to have aerodynamics that's what gives you the weasley engine that we're going to be focusing on and you also want to have landing we're going to make use of our first retractable landing gears these ly-10 small landing gears also, I want to draw attention to the fact that I have yet to upgrade either the space plane hangar or the runway. They are both still at tier one. So the jet you're going to see is perfectly capable of being built in a tier one space plane hangar and take off from a tier one runway. All right, let's get started here. Let's start off by grabbing ourselves a Mark 1 cockpit and let's take a look at the engines that we're going to be using. So we're going to be using the J-33 Weasley turbofan engine. And if you compare it to what we've used before, the J-20 Juno, the first thing to notice is that we are looking at a 1.25 meter part as opposed to the 0.625 meter smaller Juno engine. And if we take a look at the specifics you will see that with that bigger size of course comes more mass it's 1.5 tons compared to the Juno's 250 kilograms but you get significantly more thrust 120 kilonewtons of stationary thrust and we'll talk about what we mean by stationary thrust in just a moment once we fly this thing compared to the 20 kilonewtons of stationary thrust that the Juno has so Let's just take off these two engines and let's build ourselves something here. And we'll keep this 
inline cockpit. It's the new cockpit that we've unlocked. So why don't we build around that? And we'll start off with two of the Mark I liquid fuel fuselages. These provide a lot of fuel, which means that this thing is going to have quite a lot of range compared to the Juno engine. In fact, the plane we're about to build can pretty much fly to any point you want on Kerbin's surface. And on the back of that, we'll stick on our Weasley engine. As we know with jet engines, because we have no oxidizer aboard, it needs to burn the oxygen in the air. And for that, you need to have some sort of air intake. And we have two options that work well with our Weasley engine, the circular intake and the XM-G50 radial air intake. And if we take a look at the stats of these two, you will find that they are remarkably similar to each other. So if you're going to use a Weasley engine, you can either go with the circular intake or the radial intake, depending upon your design choice. Because I went with the inline cockpit, I'm going to keep that circular intake at the front like so. Now, because this thing is going to have a significant amount of range and thrust, we're going to add on some extra cabin space by going down here to utility and putting on a Mark I crew cabin. And of course, to make it a plane, we need to have some aerodynamic surfaces. And with aerodynamics tech load now unlocked, I do have quite a number of options. And I'm going to deliberately use different options on different planes. A lot of this is personal. You can decide what kind of works well for you. But I'm going to go with the simplest option, which are the swept wings that fit on like that, to which I added the Elevon 1 for a control surface. I'm using a tail fin for a rudder and then two more tail fins as elevators. These are just placed roughly for now. We'll tweak them later in the build. The primary purpose of this plane will probably be to collect science from the different biomes around Kerbin. So you're going to want to science this up with whatever you have available. As I may want to do some transmitting of science, I also added a 1K battery bank and a Communitron 16S antenna. And our Kerbals are going to want to get in and out. So we're also going to go down here to utility and grab ourselves the Kellis Mobility Enhancer. And we're going to stick that just here on the sign. Now when putting on a ladder, do pay attention to the little arrow that is on here. That tells you which way the ladder will extend. So you can see I have this one upside down. Now I talked about adjusting the aerodynamic control surfaces in great detail in the jet tutorial I linked to earlier in this video. But as that was a while ago, I'll go over the main ideas once again. First, you want to use the move tool to adjust the positions of the lifting surfaces. So the center of lift overlay, the blue ball that you can see here is just behind the center of mass overlay, which is the yellow and black ball. This will increase the stability of your aircraft. Now I don't like how the wings are covering the windows of the crew cabin. So I'm going to translate that down, which of course moves down the center of lift as well. This isn't a big deal, but to compensate, I decided to translate the elevators up. Another option for moving the center of lift is to rotate the lifting surfaces. This is a great option if you don't want to move them, but make sure you only rotate them a very small amount as a large angle of attack will dramatically increase drag. The other thing you want to do is isolate each control surface. These elevons on the wings should only control roll. The elevators at the back are for pitch while the rudder is only for yaw. I also like to tweak down the authority limiter on each of these surfaces to make the flight less twitchy, though that is a personal thing. Don't forget to test your craft. Keep tweaking things until it feels right for you. And if you are not seeing these tweaking options in your game, make sure to turn on advanced tweakables in your settings. All right, with that done, let's put on our landing gear. So we go over to ground. We now have the LY-10 small landing gear. We're going to put a single one up here at the front. Ooh, make sure the snap is on. If you have the snap off, these things can be at funny angles with the snap on. You can ensure yourself that that is indeed going straight down, which is what you want. And then we're going to put on two at the back to make a sort of tricycle type of deal. Now, you it's really tempting to just kind of stick them on the wings like this, um, because that's really where I want them at the end. But you will find that this is actually kind of fragile sometimes. It'll have a tendency to want to snap the wings off. And what works better is if you take these 
and stick them onto the fuse. Oh, let's throw them away because I did do a little bit. Just stick them onto the fuselage like this. Now, what I'm going to do though is tweak them so they end up in this position anyway. The first thing I want to do is get these things so that they are pointing straight down. So I'm going to select the rotate tool, make sure the snap is still on. We're going to grab that. We're going to rotate these so that they are vertically downwards. Again, with the snap on, it will make sure to be vertically downwards. Then we're going to go to the move tool, take the snap off, and we're going to slide these out towards where we want them. Now, there's a point where you can't slide any further. Not a problem. Hold the shift key and you can slide these out as far as you want. Now, technically, these are still attached to the fuselage, not the wings. This has a couple of advantages. Number one is if I click on the wings with the move tool, I can move the wings now independently of the landing gear, which is nice. But the main advantage is that this is structurally much, much better. Now, as far as the positions go, I want to have those rear landing gear a little bit behind the center of mass. If you find your plane does a wheelie on the runway, then you don't have them back far enough. Another thing you want to do with this setup is to disable the brakes on the forward gear and disable the steering on the rear ones. Finally, move the plane close to the floor of the space plane hangar so the wheels are just clipping. This will allow you to adjust the heights of the gear so that the forward one extends just a little bit lower than the rear ones, which will result in the plane being pitched up slightly on the runway. And with the final addition of some navigation lights, this plane was ready for its maiden flight. I don't have any good contracts suitable for this plane. But I do have some worthwhile destinations in mind, and as we travel, I do have something worth noting. Now, as we gain altitude, let's take a look at our Weasley engine here, and there's something here I want to draw attention to, and that is the thrust is going down. Notice that as we higher the altitude goes, the lower the thrust is, and that's why in the VAB they talked about this stationary thrust, because that's the thrust at sea level. As you gain altitude, the air is getting thinner. There's less air to be propelled out the back, which is what gives us propulsion, and therefore our thrust goes down. Now, as we progress through the tech tree, we will get engines and air brakes that will begin to compensate for the thinner air by taking advantage of greater speed to force more air through our engines. And we'll see that a little later. But the end result of this is that the Weasley cannot reach the altitudes we need to satisfy the contracts we saw earlier. That said, this plane is far from useless. The LY-10 landing gear are far more durable than the lower tier landing gear we used on our previous jet. This allows us to land in other biomes collecting all kinds of science. Just keep in mind, QuickSave is still your friend before attempting any landing. Within a few minute flight of the KSC, you'll find shores, grasslands, highlands, mountains, and deserts. In addition, this plane easily has the range to get to the more distant badlands, tundra, ice caps, and ice shells. Besides, while looking for science, who knows what else you may find? And with that, it's time to move on to our next jet. For our next plane, we are going to need to unlock some more nodes down on the aerodynamics. We're going to take a look at supersonic flight. That's what gives us our next engine, the J404 Panther after burning turbo fan. We're also going to unlock our Mark II cockpit and as well as some other Mark II parts. So we're going to grab that one. We're also going to grab advanced aerodynamics or some more control surfaces and advanced landing for some improved landing gear. And finally, I am going to go into the next tier here for high altitude flight for some additional air intakes as well as some more Mark II parts. This plane is going to require though a tier two space plane hangar, so we're going to upgrade that as well as a tier two runway. So this one's going to be built around the Mark II cockpit. You also have the choice of the Mark II inline cockpit, which I'm going to use for my next plane. Once again, we are going to take out the monopropellant to save ourselves some weight. And let's take a look at our newly unlocked engine, the J404 Panther after burning turbo fan. And if you compare it to the Weasley, You'll find actually, if you look at the thrust numbers, they are kind of comparable. And it's not immediately obvious what is the advantage of this J44 
Panther engine. Well, to see that, let's actually stick it on the back of this just very temporarily. And we'll click on this and I want to draw attention to that there is a toggle mode button. And if I toggle the mode, look up here, you can see now it says it's in wet mode. And if I toggle it, it's in dry mode. This terminology is actually a little bit confusing because dry mode actually means that it is using the air in the atmosphere to burn as fuel, like any normal jet engine would. And wet mode actually really means that it's closing its air intakes and it's gonna use internally stored oxidizer. But that's not what this engine does. What wet mode really is, is an afterburner, which increases the thrust dramatically. And there isn't anything in the description that really talks about that. So we're going to have to wait till we see this in action to really appreciate how it works. But in the meantime, let's go and build the rest of our plane. So I'm going to go into fuel tanks and I'm going to grab me the Mark II liquid fuselage and put it right on here. This is a liquid fuel only fuselage. Now be really careful because if you get into some of these, like for instance, the Mark II rocket fuselage, this one contains oxidizer, which I don't want. So, and they look remarkably similar. So do make sure you are grabbing the right part. I'm also going to grab the Mark II bicoupler. I'm going to put this onto the back. And if I right click on it, you'll notice that the Mark II bicoupler does have oxidizer. Again, this is going to be a jet, so we do not want the oxidizer. We're going to take the oxidizer out and we're going to turn that fuel tank off so that I'll always remember never to put oxidizer in there. And then on the back of this, we're going to put on a pair of our Panther engines. Now for these Panther engines, we want to be able to toggle between the two modes. And one thing you can do is in flight, right click on it, bring up the context menu and toggle the mode. But the easier thing to do, of course, is to use your action groups. Now this being a tier two space plane hangar, I actually only have the base action groups available to me. But if you want to, you can take something that you're not going to use, for instance, like RCS. I'm not going to put any RCS on this. I can click RCS, I can click on my engines, and I can say switch mode. And then now all I have to do is hit the RCS button and this will switch between the modes. But just to show you something, there is a funny bug that is in the game that you can take advantage of. Notice that as soon as I clicked on a part, I actually did get all of my advanced action groups. And if I wanted to, I can still use these. See, switch mode, now it's on to one. It's a weird sort of a bug that these advanced action groups come on as soon as you click a part. I'm not sure if that's intentional. I'm going to take advantage of it. Now, of course, these engines do require air intake. So once again, I'm gonna go over to aerodynamics and we have two new ones that we have unlocked. We have the adjustable ramp intake and we have the adjustable ramp intake radial. And if you compare the two, look at the intake air numbers. This has intake air of 2.0, while this one is 0.5. So they are functionally the same as far as getting up. They, they work very well in high altitudes and at high speeds, but the adjustable ramp intake does have a smaller ability to take in air, so you're going to need more of them. Because of the design that I chose, this is an inline part. It doesn't really fit on here anywhere, so I'm going to go with the adjustable ramp intake radial, and we're going to put on six of them. A good rule of thumb with air intakes is to use one appropriate air intake per engine. So if I were using the adjustable ramp intakes, I would probably use two of them to match the two Panthers that I have. And since the radial intakes are actually a quarter of the intake air of the adjustable ramp intakes, technically I should probably be using eight of them. But I found that once I tested this, six worked absolutely fine, so I just went with six. The ultimate test of any craft is just to test it and see how it works. Now let's put on some wings, and again, we have a lot of various wing parts here now. And again, my goal with this is to show you different ones, so you may want to go with a different design, but for this one, I went with the swept wing type B behind which went a structural wing type B, and then at the end I put a structural wing type D, and turned it up a little bit to give this thing a little bit more flair. And because I found I, I didn't like the look of this, like I thought this wingspan was a little bit too high, what I did is I grabbed these and I slid them inwards, 
a little bit more towards the center of the plane. At the back of the wing went an Elevon 2. And then for a rudder, I used another structural wing type D with an Elevon 4 for its control surface. And for pitch control, I used a pair of the standard canards. And then, of course, tweaked all of the lifting surfaces to get the center of lift where I wanted it to be. And then isolated each of the aerodynamic control surfaces in exactly the same way as I did with the previous plane. For the landing gear, I used my newly unlocked LY-35 medium landing gear, again attaching them to the fuselage and moving them and adjusting them again in the exact same way as you saw with my previous jet. Now as well as the usual disabling the steering on the rear landing gear, another thing that you may want to experiment with is if you get into the friction control, take it off of auto and increase the amount of friction on the back. This is particularly useful if you find that your plane slides around a lot. By putting more friction on the back wheels, that will get it to track more straight. No science on this one, though you're free to science it up. The contract only requires crew report, so I can do that as it exists right now. So with the addition of a few obligatory blinky lights, this thing was ready to fly. We're going to head off over to our first waypoint here. It's a bit of a ways away. So I'm going to gain a bit of altitude and cruise on over there. And as we're gaining altitude, want to again right click on the engine and compare it to what we saw with the Weasley. And again, level off a bit. Notice that now, although I'm gaining altitude, notice that my thrust is actually increasing. As I gain speed, these air intakes are so good at pulling in the air at high speeds that even with the thinner air, I am actually gaining thrust. Now there's clearly a limit to this. You can actually see now that my thrust is starting to drop off once again, but I want people to get that idea that with these higher tiered engines, more speed means more thrust, even at higher altitudes. That's what's going to help us get to those higher altitudes. In addition, as the air gets thinner, the craft will experience less drag to slow it down. But at the same time, there's only so much the air intakes can do, and you won't be able to avoid the lower thrust. This results in each craft having an ideal max speed cruising altitude. Experiment with your craft to find out what works best for you. In addition, as Kerbin curves away below you, you will find your craft steadily pitching up. To get back on track, I like to occasionally tap the F key, toggling off SAS. As the center of mass is ahead of the center of lift, the plane will naturally pitch down a bit each time I do this. This is much easier than pitching down with the W key, especially at high time warp. Pretty soon, I found myself in the area of the contract waypoints where I grabbed a couple of low altitude surveys before the time came for my first high altitude one, which is going to require the use of the afterburners. Okay, so we can click on this and we can go toggle mode, but remember I did put this on an action group, so all I have to do is hit one, and we have our afterburners on, dramatically increasing thrust. And aiming to get ourselves above an 18 kilometer altitude. Oh, we are in our zone. Now the afterburners do consume a lot of fuel, so you don't want to keep them on all the time. You just use them to get up to the required altitude. And we're just going to pitch right up there. I can see my apple waps is increasing, increasing, increasing. I don't want to come out of my zone here keeping a very close eye on my apple apoapsis down there at the bottom left. We're over 18. Want to clear it by a lot. 19. Watching that apple apoapsis. Okay, let's cut. I'm not quite sure what altitude I need. Oh, I need 18 kilometers, so I should be able to do a crew report. And there we go. So, we will toggle again, pressing the one key to go back into dry mode, but then I need to come back down to an altitude where the engines will reignite, and then it's just cruising on to the next waypoint and repeating this once again. And as you're climbing, make sure to keep an eye on that apple apoapsis and make sure that it is constantly increasing. 
pitch down if you find yourself not building that apoapsis up. And once I got this crew report, there was one more low altitude one to do and that finished off this contract. Since this plane doesn't have the fuel nor do I have the patience to get back to the KSC, I just landed it on the nearest convenient relatively flat surface. And now it's time to move on to our third and final jet. And for our next plane, we're going to need to unlock some more science and again, sticking with this. Now I do want to show people a couple of nodes that I'm not going to take advantage of, but you might want to. Heavy aerodynamics, which gives you a whole lot of Mark III parts, including this J90 Goliath turbofan engine. This is really an engine designed for large jumbo jets and those kinds of things. I'm not going to go there with this tutorial, but if you want to explore that, it is there for you to explore. And also heavy landing gear, uh, which are large landing gear. They're not going to be necessary for the plane I'm going to be building, so I'm not going to go there. But what I am going to unlock is over here, hypersonic flight. Hypersonic flight gives me the next engine we are going to look at in detail, the JX4 Whiplash Turbo Ramjet engine, as well as some appropriate air intake. So let's grab that. And I am going to go down here to automation for the Mark II Drone Core, which will be a very handy part for what I'm about to build, as you will see in just a little bit. But with this one unlocked, let's get started with the build. And just to change up the parts, this one I'm going to build around the Mark II inline cockpit. Again, of course, removing that mono propellant like so. And let's take a look at our newly unlocked engine, the JX4 Whiplash Turbofan engine. And I want to take a look specifically at the max thrust, 386.657 at Mach 3, comparing that to the Panther max thrust of only 107.885 at Mach 1.8. So the Whiplash, kind of the same idea as the Panther, but higher and faster is really the main theme of this one. So let's get started with our build. At the front here, I'm gonna put a Mark II to 1.25 meter adapter. And this is a part with oxidizer, so I'm gonna take the oxidizer out because I don't need it. And then behind here, I'm gonna get my newly unlocked Mark II drone core. So this is a pro body, so if you wanna lose the pilot, you can. But the main thing I'm looking at with this is, well one, it is a Mark II part that fits in very nicely right there. But two, it does have built-in set of reaction wheels. If we take a look at the torque numbers here, notice that the pitch torque, 15 kilonewton meters of pitch torque compared to the three for yaw and roll. But when you're in that upper atmosphere and those aerodynamic control surfaces aren't doing much for you anymore, that extra pitch torque is lovely to have. I then put on a Mark II crew cabin to hold an additional four kerbals should I want to. Behind that went the Mark II liquid fuselage short. Then the bicoupler, once again with the oxidizer removed, attached to which went my two whiplashes. But I'm not done with fuel yet. Radially, I added on four more Mark I liquid fuel fuselages and then used the move key, once again holding shift, so that I can slide them out of the way. The contract does require me to do pressure scans, so I do have to make sure to put on a barometer. That's the only science I'm going to put on this thing because I don't need the science, but if you want to science yours up, go right ahead. For lifting surfaces, again, I want to do different things with each of these, so this time I went with the Delta Wing, behind which went a Wing Connector Type A, and then the Structural Wing Type D at the ends, once again turned up on a jaunty slant. And for Elevons, I'm actually going to use both the Elevon 2 and the Elevon 3. Stick those on here. Now notice that this is tapered with a bigger end and a smaller end. So we'll put the bigger end closer to the engines and then we'll grab the Elevon 2 and taper them. These are designed to sort of match up nicely. And as these are pretty far back on the craft. You can actually use them for pitch authority as well. In fact, I only used one of them for roll authority and then used both of them for some additional pitch control. 
Now with the wings more or less in their final locations, I was able to move the radial fuel tanks to a more appropriate position and then cap off the back end of them with some aerodynamic nose cones. Finishing off the control surfaces, I used two standard canards for rudders, then I used two advanced canards at the front for even more pitch authority. I mean, they gotta be good, they're advanced, right? Of course, this plane is gonna require some air intakes, but before I go to what I actually used, let me show you some parts that I actually very rarely use, and those are the game's various nacelles. Uh, let's stick them all here on the side so we can take a look at each of them. We have the engine nacelle, we have an engine pre-cooler, and we have a divertless supersonic intake like that. They sort of are the same kind of ideas. They are meant to be in line. You can put engines here at the back. They also hold fuel. They're a combination fuel, t at the very least, a combination fuel tank and air intake. So if you need some extra air intake, these are there for you. The divertless supersonic air intakes are very similar to the engine nacelles, except they are designed for supersonic high altitude flight while the engine nacelle is not. The engine pre-cooler is also designed for higher altitude supersonic flight and has the benefit, and I'm putting that in some air quotes, of cooling down the engine. That said, I've never had issue with heat buildup in the engines. For me, although these things may look cool, I find all of them not particularly useful. I find them basically just heavier air intake, so I'm not going to use them. Instead though, what I am going to use is this newly unlocked shock cone air intake. This is similar in its function as a circular air intake that we saw much earlier, except it is designed to be taking in air at high altitudes and at supersonic flights. So we're gonna put on two of them at the front of this and then another one at the front of there. So we'll have plenty of air intake to feed these engines even when the air starts to get thin on us. All that came after this are the usual aerodynamic tweaks. For landing gear, I went with the same landing gear I used on the Panther jet, the medium landing gear, and put them on in exactly the same way. And then with the addition of, again, more blinky lights, this thing was ready to fly. And as we watch this glorious takeoff, I want to take this opportunity to welcome aboard my most recent Patreon patrons and YouTube members. Bailey Na, Leave You, Jim N, Nelson Baiti, WT23, and David Ward. Thank you very much to the most recent additions to the team, and of course, an extended thank you to everybody who supports this channel, whether they are subscribing and liking, or doing the extra bit of becoming a Patreon patron or a YouTube member. All of that support is greatly appreciated. And I'm going to keep the pitch relatively low at about 10 degrees or so. What I want to watch is again that engine thrust. And look at that engine thrust build as this thing gains speed. This is the secret of these whiplashes, is their ability to generate very high thrusts at very high speeds, even as the air gets thinner. And you can already see our surface speed just rocketing up. Now, as you can see here, here, let's start leveling off just a little bit. In a very short order, I am at now 19 kilometers. Let's actually level this right off, going at about 1.3 kilometers per second. It is dropping. Our thrust has dropped off quite significantly, but with the air so thin up here, there's much less drag on the vessel and that still translates into a very, very high speed. And in fact, when we talk about space planes in the next episode, this getting speed in the upper part of the atmosphere is gonna form a big part of our strategy. But for now, well, let's just time warp and get to our destination. And as Mark and Benditu pick up these three pressure scans, why don't I use this opportunity to go over the main takeaways from this episode. This one was really about how to get the most out of the jet engines in the game. By comparing three very different engines, I hope that you got the idea of their individual uses, limitations, and advantages. 
I also spent some time looking at air intakes and the importance of providing appropriate intakes for whatever engine you are using. As well I pointed out that the nacelles and pre-coolers the game provides are typically unnecessary and only serve to add unneeded extra mass. I also provided some additional landing gear tips including holding the shift key while using the move tool and modifying steering, brakes and wheel friction. And finally I looked at the importance of speed when it comes to getting the most out of the high tier engines and intakes, an idea that will very much be at the forefront next episode when I build upon the ideas presented here to build our first SSTOs. I hope to see you then.